Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Warren Bell, and I'm uh, introducing you and welcome you to the second in a series of three webinars on uh, environmental racism and environmental justice put on by CAPE, the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. My name is Warren Bell, and I am the past founding president of CAPE. My co-host is Owen Liu, co-chair co of HEART, part of the Canadian Federation of Medical Students. But first, a land acknowledgement. I am speaking from the lands of the interior Salish, and in particular, the Shkwapmik speaking, speaking Shushwap nations. These lands have never been ceded or governed by treaty. They have simply been taken. We cannot be content until this wrong is set right to everyone's satisfaction. CAPE is now established as the voice for environmental health concerns for the medical profession in Canada. And now I'm going to pass it over to Owen to introduce himself and tell you about HEART. Owen. Thank you so much, Warren, for that. Uh, my name is Owen. I am a second generation settler on Turtle Island, also a second year medical student at McGill University. I'm tuning in from what we now call Montreal, which is a site of uh, land of exchange that was the unceded territories of the Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. And I'm very proud to represent the CFMS Heart, which has become also a voice for uh, planetary health and climate action among medical students uh, in Canada towards a sustainable future. I look forward to this discussion and to learning with all of you. Thank you very much, Owen. Today we have three guests, Dr. John O'Connor, a family physician working closely for decades with Indigenous communities in Northern Alberta, Karen Hosford, an environmental consultant with many years uh, of living in Dawson Creek, BC, and Anjali Helferty, the Interim Executive Director of CAPE. After each speaker has pre presented, Owen will coordinate a question and answer period. Our first guest today is Dr. John O'Connor. John has just received the first ever Peter Bryce Whistleblower Award from Ryerson University's Center for Free Expression. John is a family physician living in Fort McMurray in the heart of the tar sands development process. Tonight, you will hear why John has won this prestigious award as we engage in a dialogue about this compelling narrative. Good evening, John. Good evening, Warren. How are you? I am well, and I hope you've got some sleep. John has been embedded in the COVID outbreak in Fort McMurray, so. I just woke up and I'll be back to sleep again in a few minutes. <laughs> Before the conversation, after the conversation is over. Okay, let's just plunge in. Um, in 1982, you graduated from medical school at the National University of Ireland, and then you started doing locums. Uh, clearly, you were looking for opportunities of adventure. You uh, initially almost made it to the Hebrides, but then you heard from a friend about a job in Nova Scotia. You went there for a little break and then you fell in love with the place and ended up working and living there for nearly a decade. Why did you fall in love with Nova Scotia, John? Uh, I think the challenge of the rural setting, um, living by the ocean, um, a land that I'd longed to visit uh, since I was a junior high school student. Um, and just, you know, something completely different. Um, it was a challenge right away. Um, I loved every second of it. Well, there's one second that you didn't love, you told me about. It was a big storm in 1991. Waves as high as 12 meters. The Coast Guard captain on a ship offshore had an incessant 24-hour nosebleed and was starting to get hypotensive. There was no other doctor ava available, and so you were taken on a cutter to the Coast Guard ship. And what happened when you got alongside that ship? Um, I uh, was looking up at the, the rail, uh, uh, at the edge of the, the ship, and the next second looking down as we were bobbing up and down. And uh, on the, uh, the, the word from the Coast Guard, the cutter's captain, I jumped from the cutter to the ship. There were four burly sailors waiting to grab me and haul me aboard. It was during the perfect storm, the, the, at least the, um, the, the storm in 1991, upon which the book and the movie were, were based. And what happened when you landed on the deck, John? I kissed the deck 
number one, uh, like being back on solid ground. Um, quickly sought out the captain who was um, a bit pale, lying down, hypotensive, um, got an ID started, uh, packed his nose and uh, then headed, steamed for shore. Sounds like a good idea at that point. Um, then the next thing that happened in your life was you credited Ralph Klein with making you move to Alberta because another Irish colleague had invited you to check Alberta just as Ralph Klein was threatening to close the door on international med medical graduates. So when a position came up, you jumped at it. And soon you were starting to see indigenous patients, some of whom came to check you out and you began to learn things from them as well. What did you learn? The first thing I learned, Warren, was to keep my mouth shut and ears open. Um, I, I was amazed, enthralled, and honored to be imparted with the traditional knowledge um, that um, they were uh, very quick um, to share. Um, I, I learned of the, the generations um, of, um, that went before and the hardship they endured. And I also heard a consistent story that related to environmental changes that they'd seen, um, you know, in the land, the water, in the air, the fish, the wildlife, the flora and fauna. And I learned that they had no word for cancer. You uh, got involved with a community in, called Jean Vier, a little community southeast of, uh, of Fort McMurray, uh, 500 or so people in it. What did you learn there? I learned, um, I guess, how downtrodden the indigenous populations are. Yeah. Reality of life on, on reserve. Um, there was something also that connected you as an Irishman to the experience that they were undergoing. What was that? It was an immediate thing. It was, you know, our, our Ireland was colonized. Uh, the indigenous populations suffered colonization as well. I, I felt. For, for a short time, like I was um, intruding, uh, I was representing, you know, everything that brought them to the, the state of life that they, you know, they found themselves in. Um, I, I felt humbled, honored to be um, allowed into the community um, and to be able to look after their health, to, to, be, to, to witness what they told me and to be able to look after their health. You also became connected to Fort Chippewyan First Nation and that community. And you established an agreement with them to, to be a doctor. What, what was the gist of that agreement that you had? Well, I was approached by the, um, the uh, health director from the community uh, to come in and start providing service. Um, it was a very you know, informal offer um, and it quickly grew into a very close relationship, nothing, nothing really on paper, uh, just a, a kind of, you know, come in, we'll fly you in, um, and a, a sort of a, an unwritten bond, more than a contract. It eventually became a 24-7 arrangement over time. What was That's that? Right. Yeah, it, 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 um, it, it seemed, it became obvious that, you know, um, I was the only doctor flying in. And uh, they were, you know, definitely in need. Um, so it, it was a very easy uh, evolution into being available by phone 24-7, uh, which, which I was. Um, and I was very happy to provide that service. And no matter where you were, you were on call. Some I was in Ireland. In Ireland. Um, I remember a trip that I made to Cuba with my wife and my brother and his wife. And sitting on... In, in the shade on a beach with um, my laptop um, and uh, getting calls and at one point getting through uh, live uh, video and sound uh, to the community. But yeah, anywhere we were, um, it, it, my phone was always at my side, at the family table, dinner, the phone would ring. It became part of our life. Now, when you first came to Fort McMurray, the industry around bitumen uh, from extracted from the tar sands was still slowly building up. But by the early 
2000s, the tar sands had really began to ramp up exponentially. One day, a Tuesday in May 2004, walked into the room. Tell us about it. Well, I was a school bus driver in Fort Chip. Um, I remember it very clearly. Um, I was in the health center or the nursing station uh, at lunchtime, uh, catching up on paperwork. Uh, the door, which was not locked, opened. I was aware of somebody coming into the um, waiting room. The, the, the lights were dimmed at lunchtime. And uh, I heard the voice. I recognized the voice and, and came out and um, I could see him standing before me, probably about six feet tall. And uh, he said, I, I, I want to make an appointment to see you. And I said, well, what's up? And as he came into the light, um, I noticed he had lost weight. I hadn't seen him, I hadn't seen him a lot, but you know, a nice, very friendly guy, but he was very jaundiced. That was the first thing that struck me. And then later it came out that where there was an unusual cancer brewing inside him. What kind of cancer did he have? It was a cholangiocarcinoma, a cancer of the, the biliary tract. Now you had already had a personal experience with cholangiocarcinoma with your father? I, I did, Warren. Yeah, my dad in September of 1993 um, had lost some weight, which he needed to, and his appetite had, had, had dropped away. Um, I was in Canada at the time. My, my mother um, noticed, we, we called usually once or twice a week, and uh, she said, um, your dad is, is jaundiced. Um, six weeks later to the day, he passed away. Um, and he actually had a cholangiocarcinoma. That was my first encounter with Indeed. this horrible cancer. And then shortly afterwards, um, somebody came in, called, what happened? What was, who was, and what happened to him? An elder in the community in Fort Chip who lived uh, extremely traditionally. He lived in the bush, um, spent most of his time in his cabin. Um, and he was found in his cabin uh, quite unwell and brought in and he had lost weight. He was deeply jaundiced. Um, of course, you know, Fort Shipping, a flying community, mm. our, our referral center is Fort McMurray. And he so, also had a cholangiocarcinoma. A cholangiocarcinoma, and he passed away shortly afterwards. And then you heard about a third case of cholangiocarcinoma that had occurred in Fort McMurray, but from a, a person from Fort Chip. Yeah, and, and, and actually there were three in Fort Chip and, and three in Fort McMurray. Indeed. And there's a couple more, actually. It's five in total in Fortune. So I did a little back of the envelope calculation about the incidence of cholangiocarcinoma. The actual background incidence, and you, you pass it on to me, is one in 200,000. But you were seeing a rate, uh, and that's a percentage rate of 0.0005%. But you found three cases at the time in a community of 1,200. And that's a rate of 0.25%. So listeners should know this represents a 500-fold increase over background occurrence. Now, you knew something was going wrong, and yet you wanted to be sure that it wasn't just you. So you talked to colleagues, uh, nurses, doctors, as well, of course, to uh, ongoing dialogue with Fort Chip and other Indigenous communities. And you found that they were seeing what you were seeing. Yeah, they, they, they had, uh, my, my inquiries, my discussion with them, uh, give them uh, pause to reflect. Mm -hmm. And they said, absolutely, we are seeing uh, a greater amount of pathology, including cancers yeah. coming up. Now these, these docs were not in the community. They were, they were in uh, Fort Mac. Yeah. And of course, seeing patients by referral. Um, but, you know, with the discussion, um, they came back and said, yeah, we, we are actually seeing a lot. And then uh, one fatal, one fateful day, I was going to say fatal, one fateful day in the winter of 2006, you had a call from Eric Dedenson, a reporter with the CBC, and you finally said, this is it, I'm going to talk. And how did that conversation go? So Eric was sent, uh, he was with the CBC in Edmonton, uh, sent up to Fort Mac to, to uh, look at establishing a bureau uh, Eric had spoken with uh, a number of prominent citizens in Fort McMurray, including Frances Jean, a prominent a businesswoman, a, a pillar of the community. Uh, Frances knew about Fort Chip through relatives, and she also 
had uh, was aware that I had concerns about the community, so she put Eric on to me. She what said, did "I think you guys talk about that day." I, uh, so Eric um, sort of posed an open question: "Have you concerns about poor Chip?" And I said, "I have," mm -hmm. and I gave him a thumbnail of what I had been seeing, and 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 to put it in perspective. This is after I had uh, communicated with, in vain, with Health Canada to get them to look, to see what I was seeing. Multiple times and they had not responded. None, absolutely. And so at that point, your speaking up to Eric Dennison started a trickle that eventually started to become a flood, a flood of interest from all parts of the area and broader and even all over the world. Um, one of the things that happened was that Health Canada decided to or offered to do a study uh, of people who died in Fort Chip as including those who had moved away uh, to other parts of the world. Um, and then Suncor had a project which resulted in a big community consultation in Fort McMurray about this their project and at that point the health issues started to really come up in a big way. Um, the ERCB, the Energy Conservation Resources Board, was involved as usual. And then the Health Canada report came out early, but it wasn't given to the people in Fort Chip. It was given at this public hearing. Very, very strangely, um, at the intervention hearings in Fort McMurray, uh, Health Canada, uh, around the time of the health uh, question being raised, um, made their presentation and uh, proclaimed that they had done a health a, a cancer study of the community they, they had taken the deceased files out of the community and uh, and they said we we are happy to say that for chip uh, has no higher rate of cancer than anywhere else so we, we are assuring you and a week later for chip was given the information by health canada so it was sort of an insult to the people who were actually experiencing the problem Absolutely. It, it, you know, it, it seemed to everyone that, uh, you know, um, knew that the information had been passed uh, a week before. It seemed a, a very cynical way uh, to treat the community. And, and then, course, and then you know, sorry, sorry, Jim. Okay. Sorry. And then you got uh, word that uh, the Medical Post had published a study which showed that there was, in fact, they said a 28% increase in cancer. And you had confirmation from uh, Dr. Kevin Timoney, uh, an independent consultant, who said, yes, this is really happening. And even Mother Jones, the American investigative uh, journalism magazine, came up and did a story about what was going on. It, the, the heat was starting to build up. That's right. Um, uh, the, the interest was everywhere. Um, and the, the difference in, you know, between Health Canada's approach uh, to dealing with the serious issues in Port Chip, um, uh, as opposed to other independent uh, analysis, um, the, the the contrast was shocking, Indeed. and I, that that just mushroomed everything, you know. It... And right in the middle of all this, the Alberta College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, dropped off a missive to you. And in this missive were three complaints about your conduct. What were the complaints, John? So the complaints rev uh, revolved around um, um, being uh, slow to impart information to Health Canada regarding my concerns in the community, um, double dipping, uh, a billing irregularity, which was totally fabricated. Yes. Uh, also that I was raising undue alarm in Port Chip. So they basically took, took everything apart that you had been working on, all the evidence that had supported it, in fact, the studies that had been uh, corroborating what you had found. Um, it got so crazy at this point that you were even thinking of moving back to Nova Scotia. You said, this is, I don't want to go through all this nonsense. Absolutely. Um, we had an offer from the community where I lived um, uh, for us to come back, and it worked at least part-time. Uh, so it, it seemed a, a good time to do this, not to cut our ties with Northern Alberta, mm -hmm. but sometime each month in, in Nova Scotia. So we actually jetted back and forth for two years, <laughs> which 
a, a phenomenal experience. I, I can imagine. While this was going on, um, you you told the community in, in Fort Chip that you had been accused of raising undue alarm. What did they have to say about that? They were outraged. They said, "You're our doctor. You became our voice. You you put our our concerns uh, right in the public where we wanted them to be. Uh, you're standing up for us." And actually, they offered as a community all twelve hundred of them to come to Edmonton to appear before the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta and, and let them know that I am not doing anything wrong. I'm not proclaiming any false uh, fake news that this is actually real in the community. And actually they said, come up and see for yourselves. While this was going on, people like uh, David Schindler, the famous Canadian bio biologist who's just died recently, had been doing research, the research was starting to vindicate the findings that you had, the stories that we were hearing from, from so many of these stories from indigenous witnesses. And then in 2008, 2009, there was a little breakthrough. The Alberta Cancer Board concurred that there was a 30% increase in cancers and recommended a comprehensive study. You were involved with setting up that study, the design for it. What was that like? Yeah, well, I was asked to be part of the scientific team to put the template together for a terms of reference for a study, mm -hmm. uh, which was very encouraging. So we sat around a table uh, virtually and in person for about a year. Putting mm -hmm. this so it was uh, really carefully worked through. It wasn't a, a sort of off the cuff sort of thing. And when this came to the attention of the medical officer of health working for Alberta Health Services, Brent Friesen, what did he say? What did he say you had to do to make it better? <laughs> he said, you have to uh, include industry, the oil industry as part of a management oversight committee on any study, which was a, a, a real bombshell. And when you took that, that industry involvement notion to Fort Chip, what was the immediate response from, from your indigenous friends? It was rejected out of hand. They said, as we had predicted, many of us around the table had predicted, their response was, this could be like the fox looking after the hen house. Hmm. We want an independent, credible, comprehensive study. We don't want industry involved in any way, shape or form. And as a result, to this day, no health study has ever been done. The Minister for Health said to the community, if you don't accept this, we're not doing a health study. And they said, we will, we will accept your study without industry. And they said, no, and, and they walked away and have never come back. Well, right in the middle of this in 2010, you finally got um, a quasi vindication of the college. You'd had three years struggling to address this, this, these complaints. And finally, they declared you, as you called it, uninnocent. Yes, yes, I, I had, I had uh, been um, found uh, to be slow in responding to uh, Health Canada, despite the fact that I provided ample evidence to say, I'm, this is what I've given them, this is what I've done. Uh, and so be, in, being, in being cleared, um, I, was not, I was not able to appeal anything. It, it was a very bittersweet um, ending to it. Nevertheless, good to get it out of the way so we could continue our struggle. They're off your back, finally. Yeah. John, as the, the years have gone by, over your, your support and your connection to the Indigenous community has remained strong. And as you said earlier, they, they've asked you to stay on as their voice. They, they, you, you have worked out a close bond with the Indigenous, multiple Indigenous communities and individuals. Um, what would you say through all of this is the most, some of the more important things you have learned from your indigenous friends and colleagues and that have played, who have played such an important role in your life? I've learned that the, the place of advocacy that, that we, we're all bound to, to, uh, to observe um, has, um, an extremely important um, part to play in our interactions with everyone. It, it, it has taught me 
not not just about the indigenous community, but about the world. Once once we see an issue um, uh, that that is uh, truly in need of addressing, um, as not just as physicians, but as 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 ordinary people, we absolutely need to step up to the plate and we need to stand up and be counted and and stand up for the downtrodden. John, this has been an unusual and powerful experience for you, and and obviously. Canadians have now learned about it as you have received the Peter Bryce Whistleblower Award. You said to me, it's breathed new life into the Fort Chip community. What do you mean by that? It, it was a, like a revindication of the struggle that the community has had for years and years. It, it, it again bolstered and affirmed that a traditional knowledge is, is all important, that the, the struggle in Fort Chip, which is, is a life and death struggle, um, is going on, it's real, it's got support. Um, it, it, it was the right thing at the right time, Warren. Um, we, we have been energized by this. How do you think this fits into your life? I mean, you've, you've been involved now for decades in this issue. Fate put you here, but also your spirit of adventure and your, your Irish penchant for travel. What do you think it's, it's your role in all this has been? It's, 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 it's a big role. You know, um, yeah, it, it might objectively seem like that, but it, it, it affirmed and reaffirmed that my, my, my sense of duty nothing more, nothing less. The job I was doing um, is, is, is 100% important, is, is, is vital to continue doing. I, 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 I accepted the award on behalf of the people that have been struggling for year, forever to have their voices heard and, and, and dedicated it to, to, uh, to those people. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think I was flagging in my my efforts and my my support and determination to get a, a health study done, um, but it sure. <laughs> it's a powerful moment. Absolutely, absolutely. John, you told me also that the community is excited because they've said maybe this will compel the governments involved to actually finally do the study that they have deferred for so long. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know what? Despite all of the the, the disappointments and the um, being ignored and brushed aside and um, you know um, put off as, as being um, so sort of self enriching, um, all of all of the terms that have been used, um, the community is still optimistic, and and, and I think this recognition by Ryerson has. Help that enormously. John, I want to thank you for the work you've done and for being with us today and sharing your story with us today as well. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you very much, Warren. So after that, we're going on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Karen Hosford, an environmental consultant who has worked in BC on advocacy on behalf of farmers and others harmed and displaced by the fracking industry in northeastern BC, including a particular story about a family holding called Penalty Ranch. Karen, welcome to our whistleblower session. Thank you. Just... Hi, thanks, Warren. I'm just going to start my presentation. Just need it. Can we? Just my presentation is not is disabled here by the host. Can you see that now, Warren? Not yet. Did you click on share screen? I did. And your, your presentation is open already? Mm hmm There we go. OK, I should go now. There we are. Excellent. Okay. 
Thanks, Warren, for the introduction. It's an honor to speak here today. Uh, today, I'll be talking about my journey living in Northeastern BC and the experience of speaking out against the oil and gas industry. Up on the screen on the left is the Peace region before development, and on the right is some multi-well fracking pads, what the environment looks like after oil and gas development. A little bit more about me, I'm an environmental scientist and I spent the first 12 years of my career working in the mining industry and the last decade as an environmental consultant where I worked as a technical advisor on behalf of indigenous groups across Canada. This map um, that you see now, the yellow star, is where I lived in Dawson Creek uh, for the last seven years. The red dots are the over 28,000 fracked wells that um, have been developed in northeastern BC in over the past decade. We decided to move to Dawson Creek in 2013 to raise our kids in the country. These are pictures of the house that uh, my, husband, my family and I recently sold uh, because we were being encroached upon by uh, oil and gas development that with a multi-well pad of uh, hydraulically fracked wells that would uh, be located within 800 meters of our home. Here you can see our kids playing freely outside. We lived in a really great neighborhood at the end of a country road, um, which really was our dream plan. We expected to retire here, but recently moved to the south because of the oil and gas development in our neighborhood. Um, this all changed this great picturesque uh, scenery in 2018 when we received our first notification that they'd be developing a multi-well pad above our house. The map that's um, on the screen now, uh, the red is where we used to live, our nine acres. Uh, below us was a dairy farm and you can see the yellow uh, circle, which is the water well uh, that supplied the home. Um, the home and the dairy farm below us with water and above less than 800 meters was the multi well pad, which had 16 well heads. Uh, this is a map that's a little further blown up and um, this is where um, you can see um, the extensive changes in the neighborhood. When we first, when I first started advocating against the multi-well pad, the one that's just above our house, I had no idea of the, of the greater problem that surrounded us. If you look at all the beige pads, it's actually a combination of a bunch of different multi-well pads that have been developed over time around the Dawson Creek area. <clears throat> By the end, we um, we noticed that um, we were we did the math and the different approvals that were coming in. We were living within three kilometers of over a hundred fracked wells, and all of the health data health data showed that when you live in that close proximity to the fracked wells, um, within three kilometers, you have the greatest health impacts, and the most vulnerable are children. And our children at the time were six and eight. Uh, we pushed back from the beginning, uh, myself and my neighbor, Dr. Ulrika Meyer, we went door to door and opposed uh, door, -to -door, door to door collecting letters to bring to the Oil and Gas Commission to oppose this um, health and environmental disaster <laughs> developing within our neighborhood. Um, and the more we pushed back, the more they came back in and, and uh, shut us down. Uh, it became pretty apparent the more vocal we got within the community. Uh, many neighbors who were once spent Christmas Eve at our house um, and uh, we went at our house, stopped talking to us. And when we bring our, bring our kids to hockey or skating, many friends no longer acknowledged us. And it was clear their alliance with the oil and gas companies, which you can't blame them. It really is the bread and butter for many families in these areas, but they have well, who I really blame is the government for not protecting us through much stronger environmental and health regulations. 
<clears throat> and in January of 2018, the development of the fracking wells, you can see up on the left side, the truck, the small country roads were basically pushed out of our neighborhood. We had large semis running through them. Uh, this is a sign from just above the well pad above our house with the poisonous gas. Um, and nobody seemed to be watching over it, regulating it or monitoring it. <clears throat> Within a short period of time, we had many um, people in our neighborhood selling their houses for under uh, market value and reporting deep depression and other health aspects, other health issues uh, related to what they felt was the mental stress of the developments of the oil and gas around them. This letter was uh, cleverly written um, it was sent to me, it was anonymous, and uh, it was written to be intimidating and without being able to be considered uh, uh, criminally, uh, criminally um, you could not persecute someone for writing this, but it was right on the edge. Um, it was not written by somebody in our community and we couldn't trace the letter. Uh, we learned that others who had spoken out against the industry had gotten similar letters, and, which were also cleverly disguised, disguised with poor grammar. And we just knew the intimidation had begun. Around the same time that this was all going on in my neighborhood, I started reading the Andrew Nikoforic, uh, Slick Water, the book uh, called Slick Water. It's about it's about another women's battle against the oil and gas industry and the um, Alberta Energy Board. I was astonished at that our experiences with it, uh, oil and gas uh, retaliation for whistleblowing were so similar. Jessica Ernst obviously battled on a much grander stage, but there were so many common threads in techniques and language. I was called a hysterical woman, the same as she was. The RCMP was involved and the non-action of our government to respond or intervene was identical. I also had a neighbor that called the RCMP on me for taking a picture from a public road on an oil and gas, of an of a oil and gas development on their property and they wanted me criminally charged with cr criminal harassment. These dark times left uh, myself and my husband uh, isolated and attacked in our own home without the ability to protect the things that were most precious to us, which are our family and our home. As the oil and gas projects um, were developed in my neighborhood, I became connected to a small group of landowners, ranchers and farmers based in the town of Farmington, located between Dawson Creek and Fort St. John. Farmington was actually developed uh, probably about six years uh, before they came over to our location, Briar Ridge, outside of Dawson Creek. Um, and they'd started a small advocacy group called Peace in the Environment Society. The objective was to advocate uh, for stronger regulations for the oil and gas industry to protect the environment and human health. I listened to stories of locals telling me about 24-hour flaring and drilling and people's houses sinking from the fracking activities underneath their homes and earthquakes they felt at night caused by fracking. I had one 75 year old man approach me at a meeting and asking if his uh, sore throat and nosebleeds could be related to the fracking wastewater they were discharging on his property. I later found out that his personality had really changed um, after they developed five multi-well pads on his property. I told him I wasn't a physician. I said he should go see a doctor. He said he did and he was told to move out of the area. He had lived in the peace his whole life and he asked me where would he go. I was astonished at the number of people I knew in the community with rare cancers and in particular glioblastoma is a rare form of brain cancer. I knew I had to help give the people in the piece of voice, in particular the ones who were tied to the land and could not leave. During this time, I was promoted around a kitchen table to the president of Peace Environment Society. 
The original team was wary after 10 years of battle, but is determined to make a change. And shortly after this, I met the Kirschbaums. This here is a picture of Penalty Ranch. The Kirschbaums were members and are members of Peace Environment Society. And they've reached out to me to see if I could assist them with an upcoming, upcoming oil and gas appeal as in the capacity as an environmental consultant. They had, the crew energy was proposing a five acre, two five acre fracking wastewater facilities on their grazing, agricultural grazing lease. The, I agreed to help them and uh, headed out to, with my family to meet the Kirschbaums and see the property. This is a picture of Penalty Ranch. And it's um, the Kirschbaums have owned and operated the ranch for over 40 years. They raise organic cattle and it is breathtakingly beautiful. It's located on the edge of the Peace River and is uh, on the same uh, geographical fault line as the Site C Dam. The water source for the ranch is a freshwater spring that flows through a wetland just up on the ridge there you can see above the ranch. It provides water for the family and the cattle. Anya Hutchins and Hans Kirschbaum have been appealing Crew Energy's request for oil and gas development at Penalty Ranch for years. And they're with their neighbors laughing, saying, why don't you just take the money? They continue to fight every single day with limited Wi-Fi, phone services, regardless, they make it happen. And to me, they really are environmental warriors. They fought and lost their last appeal against Crew Energy, who had proposed the development of a number of different, I think it was five multi-well pads that sort of would surround the ranch. They even had Dr. Jill Wendling, a recognized geotechnical groundwater expert as their, as their expert witness. And they even, even at that, they lost the appeal. The fracking wells are slated, were slated to commence construction this past January. This is a picture of what the two five acre wastewater ponds would look like if they were constructed. I contacted Dr. Jill Wendling for some advice with the upcoming appeal to see how I could help the Kirschbaums better. And uh, for some advice, he said that we needed to seek legal representation. The oil and gas tribunals are not based on scientific scientific based outcomes, but protecting the interests of the oil and gas companies. But any of the pro bono legal help we looked for said they wouldn't take the case because it didn't have a chance of winning. These are um, the Kirschmans currently have 13 of these C rings on their property and they are full of fracked wastewater and they're considered not as safe as the two larger ponds. So um, when, when I went to visit the Kirschbaums, we decided we wanted to take in a, a water sample to see if we could have some environmental data to provide to the oil and gas at the oil and gas appeal tribunal. But we needed to get Crew Energy's uh, permission to collect the samples and we were denied. When you visited these sites, it's, they were it smelled so much like chemicals, it just burned your nose and took your uh, breath away. This is the group that um, was, uh, we were facing at the, the final oil and gas tribunal. Um, it was just stacked. They were really seasoned, well-paid lawyers. These are crew energy's legal team. And uh, I was just astonished at the, at the imbalance of uh, power. Two minutes, Karen. Okay. The hearing proceeded virtually for three days and the Kirschbaums had to travel to ensure they had proper Wi-Fi while the cruise, cruise lawyers showed up fresh and ready for battle. At the end, I was denied um, approval to participate because uh, the Kirschbaums did not meet the timeline to have me added as an expert witness and they denied my approval to participate and just as someone to support them as I was not a lawyer. The hearing ended and we're still awaiting the outcome of the, of the hearing, but if history is a predictor of the future, the out outcome 
is a foregone conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. As you can see, life in the peace can be hazardous to your health. So there we go. Our thank you again, Karen. Uh, our final speaker today is Anjali Helferty, the interim executive director of CAPE, whose PhD thesis published last November examines the interface between settler environmental advocacy and indigenous, indigenous communities. Her thesis was provocatively titled, We're Really Trying and I Know It's Not Enough, Settler Anti-Pipeline Activists and the Turn to Frontline Solidarity with Indigenous Peoples. Welcome, Anjali. Thanks so much, Warren. Um, while I, I'll put my, my slides up here and I should say that we're gonna go in a bit of a di different direction here for a minute. So um, I hope you'll, you'll bear with me on a bit of a right turn. Um, I'll do my best to bring this, bring this back around to put it in context and um, look forward to hearing from the Q&A and further discussion about bringing these pieces together. So I, I titled this pres presentation Solidarity and Making Change uh, I wanted to start by acknowledging the land though. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge the land I'm on, which is the territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, the Patoon, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and a place now called Toronto where lots of um, indigenous peoples have moved through throughout time and also is the home to many indigenous peoples today. The territory is governed by the Turo Wampum, which is an agreement to care for the land in the broadest sense of the world. The word. And the conversation we're having today, um, I think in a lot of ways, is about how settlers can be relatives on the land and is really rooted in respect for the land and Indigenous peoples. And since I did this research as part of a PhD, I also want to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. John Paul Restoul, who's at the University of Victoria now, um, and whose guidance was really essential to my learning. Just to go through a brief agenda, I'm gonna start and do the academic thing and talk about a few framing concepts that I hope you'll find interesting. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my research findings and then bring a connection to CAPE and the stories that we've heard here today. Um, and as I said, we can hopefully talk more about that in the question period. So my research studied the efforts of settler or non-Indigenous and mostly white anti-pipeline activists um, to try to situate their anti-pipeline activism as frontline solidarity. I approached the PhD wanting to gain insight into activist partnerships and coalitions that brought together with movements with different worldviews. And I wanted to do that because my own experiences of trying to do this kind of coalition building as a youth climate activist had been really difficult, really taxing. And I just wasn't able to figure out why a group of people who were so committed to climate action and to environmental justice, we're not able to kind of come together all that well. So I came to the research project trying to understand what had made the work so difficult and to dig into the often articulated assertion that good intentions aren't enough. I chose anti-pipeline activism and you can see on the slide, um, this is from around the time of the research a few years ago, that um, that this was a really active struggle at the time. Um, and it was also a place where there's a, a clear common goal between the environmental activists, the settler activists and indigenous communities, which was to stop pipelines. There was no sort of, generally speaking, no, you know, you can't have a half pipeline. You either have the pi pipeline or you don't have it. So there was a real common understanding of wanting to stop the pipelines. I thought that was a place that there was the potential to find room for solidarity. Um, that was a little bit different from the experiences I had had previously. So just to briefly run through a few framing concepts, the research was situated in what I came to call, though I didn't invent the term, uh, settler environmentalism. Environmental activism in Canada is premised on the understanding that settler people have the right to make decisions on indigenous land. And it often engages settlers, and this is also what we do at CAPE, to, um, to pressure settler governments 
to adopt or reject policies related to the use of the land, or in the case of conservation, to quote unquote, protect land um, from people. As such, environmentalism sort of plays within the rules of and reinforces the, system, reinforces the systems that settlers created on the land. So I have a photo here that from a campaign that'll probably be familiar to a lot of people. It's the really long lasting campaign, decades long campaign that the International Fund for, for Animal Welfare and PETA in particular, as well as Greenpeace in the past had organized to stop the seal hunt. And while Greenpeace, I should say, has apologized for the campaign in recent years, is making a real attempt to figure out how to better engage with indigenous communities. Um, this campa campaign was really harmful. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen the film, Angry Anuk. It's a great film. I really recommend that you watch it. But to give the tiniest couple of stats, after the European Union banned um, white coat, banned white coat seal skins um, from being imported, the average income of a, an Inuit seal hunter went from $54,000 a year to $1,000 as a result of a collapse in the sea, seal market. And this was accompanied by a really terrible spike in suicide rates in the North where they remain uh, in Nunavut, some of the highest in the world to this day. And this is even though the seal ban actually didn't apply to, uh, to the seals that were being hunted by Inuit, but um, it, was a, it was about the collapse in the market. So kind of environmental organizations making a case that you know, they weren't meaning to do anything wrong to any indigenous peoples. Um, it's, this is sort of the point of saying, it doesn't matter that much what you were meaning to do, the, the harm is there. And I would argue that even if this was the only harm that people working under a banner of environmentalism had ever caused indigenous peoples, and it certainly isn't, it would be much too much. So I'm starting, I'm starting from this framework of understanding this as a system that many of us and many of my research participants work in a sort of seller environmentalist system. The next concept I engage really deeply with was solidarity. Uh, and what I want to point out about solidarity is the con as the way in the way it was used by the activists and the ways that I often use it myself is that it creates multiple groups. So there's a group that's the frontline group that is often considered more impacted by the issue. And then there's a solidarity group. And that's a group that maybe is a bit impacted or maybe isn't, but is the sort of, in a sense, um, working on a, an injustice that's perpetrated on a different group. And ex an example you're likely familiar with is the anti-apartheid movement. I have a photo from this here. Um, and in a way of what seems a really clear example of people in the UK, Canada, the US, et cetera, around the world working locally to stop apartheid, which is happening in South Africa at the time. So there's a really clear sense of, you know, who the impacted people are and who the people are who are part of the fight and joining in the fight, but are less impacted. Um, and this, just for fun, this is my aunt in the UK, uh, who actually is still engaged with anti-apartheid activism to this day. I also engage quite a lot with the concept of whiteness, but I'm going to leave this for now Happy to loop back later, but I thought I would mention it since um, I think whiteness plays a really big role in um, what it means to be an environmentalist in Canada today. So for my research, I was particularly looking to how settler anti-pipeline activists who were in organizations, generally speaking, um, turned to frontline solidarity with indigenous peoples when in a context when they themselves felt a really strong connection to the issue. The campaigns were, this is in contrast with something like anti-apartheid. So the campaigns to stop pipelines were about clean water and climate change. That's what people told me that the campaigns were about. The settler acti activists weren't originally coming to the issue because they were brought there by indigenous leaders or because they found themselves in a particularly unique position to speak out on a problem. And I would contrast that with um, both of our previous speakers this evening. The settler activists genuinely wanted to have a good relationship with indigenous peoples and were aware of some of the problems that I just talked about that are often perpetrated by settler environmentalism. 
They're aware of the risk of attempting to co-opt Indigenous people who are really central in particular to engaging in anti-pipeline activism because of the unique legal and moral relationship to land into a pre-existing settler campaign. So even while they sometimes inadvertently would describe a process that was quite co-opting um, in using Indigenous rights as their own legal strategy, they also at the same time would talk about deliberately not wanting to engage in that approach. So there is a kind of push-pull between a habit and what they were trying to get out of, but some awareness of that. However, at the end of the day, the win for this campaigns was stopping pipelines. It wasn't about self-determination at the end of the day for the settler activists. Um, so spoiler alert, you don't need to read my dissertation. Um, the approach of trying to bring solidarity into a pre-existing campaign, especially a funded campaign, um, where it was people's job to stop pipelines, didn't work all that well in general. However, what I think is interesting we can talk about today, there were cases where some practically useful work was done, even if the theoretical uh, elements that were kind of problematic were still there. And I'm in favor of practically useful things. So uh, I'll talk about them for a minute. So for example, um, you might recall that at the time um, of the Standing Rock uh, land defense that there were complaints about you know, young white people treating it like Burning Man. Okay, I'm like Burning Man. And one of the participants that I talked to, the research participants talked about how she went to Standing Rock and you know brought resources to the camp and engaged in cooking and cleaning and really tried to contribute something to camp and understand her role there. So I thought that's great. Um, like the poster you can see here, there were also a number of fundraisers or other transfer of resources to support indigenous led efforts. And the actions at simultaneously, simultaneously worked against pipelines, which is what these folks were really invested in and supported in indigenous sovereignty. So in that way, there is a way to do both. There were also examples of environmentalists who developed personal relationships with a nearby chief or community leaders, often or maybe worked in the same office even. And as a result, we're able to respond in a good way to any asks um, and what was going on in the community or the nation. And this seems to me most similar to Dr. O'Connor and Karen's experiences today where the environmentalists, you know, they had plenty of analysis about solidarity, um, but they were actually just responding to what was in front of them and the relationships that they had developed. So in thinking about CAPE and in the stories we've heard today, I'll say I didn't talk to health professionals. Two minutes, Warren? Yeah, okay. Um, I didn't talk to health professionals for my dissertation, but I did talk with some environmental lawyers and I found the lawyers had quite a different relationship to indigenous peoples they were working with. It's, it's actually exactly what Dr. O'Connor said, um, keeping your mouth shut and your ears open. It turns out the, some of the lawyers were really good at that. And so they were able to um, really take time, build relationships, be really thorough. And that isn't the NGO mode. I can tell you this because I work in an NGO <laughs> and I've worked in NGOs in the past. And we are people who, you know, we want to get the thing done. We're in a campaign, we move forward, we're, we um, operate quite quickly. And I think that's actually in a lot of times to the detriment of the work. It's also really clear throughout my work that solidarity and helping are not the same and solidarity and charity are not the same. Um, and I think that's interesting to think about in the context of help, helping professions like the ones many of you are in. Um, but I, that isn't how, you know, when I've in the past 10 months that I've been at CAPE, that isn't how um, I've heard the physicians and the nurses who are part of CAPE talk about their environmental work. So I'm uh, happy to talk more with you all. I'd be curious in your take about helping professions and solidarity. What drew me to CAPE in the first place is the opportunity to engage strategically with the power that physicians, nurses, and other health providers are given in our society and to use that power to address really important issues, many of which are related to land. And then coming at this work from a health perspective, as I've learned from you all, means that moving a proposed landfill from a place where it will impact one community to a place where it will impact another will never be okay. And advocating for a policy that costs an entire community their livelihoods will never be okay. 
there's a rootedness that I'm learning from the CAPE community um, about social determinants of health that enables CAPE's work and the really important advocacy we've heard about earlier to come from a lot of knowledge and careful consideration and deep relationships. Certainly using this power that's afforded to physicians and nurses doesn't mean that other people in power, like the government, are necessarily gonna come on side. We've seen plenty of evidence of that this evening. And I don't know that I have um, a solution or can pretend to have a solution to a scenario where um, knowledge becomes a threat and communities that are supposed to be considered disposable in our, our kind of horrible societal hierarchies um, where you know people, are, people who are considered high in the hierarchy are speaking out about that. Clearly there's um, a risk and real consequence to that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm interested in engaging further with you all. Uh, we, I think we really learned today what it can mean to try to use this power. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Anjali. Um, showing some of the pitfalls that can arise when well-intentioned people have not connected fully with the people that they want to help. Um, I'd now like to hand over uh, to the Q&A period and Owen, my co-host, is going to um, coordinate that part of today's event. Uh, Owen, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bell, for giving me the stage. But before I get on with the q and I just want to take the time to acknowledge the incredible stories and expertise that was shared with us across the board from Dr. John O'Connor, Karen Hosford, and Angela Halperty. I think for me as an uh, observer, as well as the moderator, I really got a chance to appreciate, I think, the power and unfortunate power of power dynamics in, in the way that we feel either silenced or we feel empowered to make a difference. And that was really clear from Dr. John O'Connor's story of navigating those power dynamics um, from his own activism and his advocacy. I think it's very clear from Karen's story about how we can do better to make sure that the voices that aren't heard are being listened to and are being projected out there so that we are not just like shoving them under the carpet and realizing that although they're distal from us doesn't mean that their stories don't matter as much as ours. And I think another really important thing that was raised by Anjali was how, how easily sometimes it is to feel as if we have to get involved for our own sense of fragility and we forget about how involvement as settlers, many of us are, has to be done not as a sense of charity, but more in a sense of solidarity. So thank you for raising that. As a healthcare student myself, I thought that especially the, the concept of, of power dynamics was an interesting one for, for myself, given that as students and learners, I'm, I'm often navigating power dynamics myself in a healthcare environment where I might be noticing something on the wards, but there might be a preceptor or other senior residents that might be thinking in a different way than maybe my observations might be telling my heart to say. So I guess the question I have on, on behalf of healthcare students to the panel and anyone can respond is what can healthcare learners do to practically join this narrative? Um, given that of course like we are learners and, and not professionals yet and hopefully in the future very soon we will be joining the ranks, but what exactly can we really do to really offer some aid in this narrative and to make things better in terms of solidarity with indigenous peoples and, and reaching some sort of um, environmental justice in the face of this environmental racism. And I'll let the panelists uh, discuss. John, do you wanna say something about that? First, you better unmute yourself. <laughs> Yeah, um, could you just repeat the question? Yes, the question was, as healthcare learners, um, especially emerging healthcare professionals, what can we do to join the narrative and, and act in a way, recognizing that we have limitations as being just learners, uh, to productively aid in, this, uh, in these endeavors? I think from an individual perspective, just look around you. Look around, you see all, all that's wrong, and, and it, it doesn't take uh, much of a focus uh, to see that. 
you know, in your own neighborhood um, and, and stand up and speak out. Um, you know, you're, you're absolutely not wrong. And uh, you will be safe and secure in the knowledge that you're not wrong by the reaction of those that criticize you. It, it's, it's very curious. Um, you know, I, I would start with that and, you know, then look, focus on the bigger picture as well. And, and don't, be, don't be afraid to, to add your voice to, you know, to sort of grassroots movements. Yeah, you know, it's, it's Fort Chip and the areas downstream of the tar sands have been spoken of as a sacrificial zone. And, and that's exactly what it is. And that's, that's how the people feel. You know, any any modicum of support, any any acknowledgement, um, a small voice, one voice, is very powerful. The, the power of one. I would say, stand up and and shout it from the rooftops. And if you shout it down, you know you're doing the right thing. I, I would just add from a, again from a medical perspective, uh, Owen, that. Advocacy is one of considered one of the core functions of especially family physicians. And so I don't think there's any shame or, or divergence from one's purpose as a physician to become an advocate when you see a wrong, uh, echoing what John just said, you speak up and don't sit back. It's just to briefly jump in from outside the medical community, you know, I don't have much of a sense that um, say speaking, speaking up in whatever context that, you know, as a non-medical person, I think med students are less equipped. <laughs> you know, I say it's a medical person of some kind. Um, and, you know, they know more than I do <laughs> about, about medicine. So I think there may be a, I'm getting um, a sense and having just been a PhD student, I also understand there's a real hierarchy within the community that, um, those of us who are outside who you may be advocating to or advocating in relation to um, are not part of necessarily. So there's a real opportunity outside medicine to, um, to advocate where being part of the medical system is enough, even as you're a med student. I just think um, meeting people where they are and going the extra mile for what makes sense. Like you think back to the 70 year, five, 75 year old man, his name's actually George. And I never forget him every time I wanna give up or people shut me down. I think about him and the doctor that told him that he should just leave because he had a sore throat, his nose was bleeding, certainly not a physician, but to me, what's the right thing to do? That's not the answer give them the tools or, or some, somewhere to go to help them. See, the questions are piling up, Owen. Yes, I'm, I'm noticing. I just have one more question uh, on my side and I'll get to the questions in the Q&A box. Um, I know we talk a lot about solidarity and working in partnership with indigenous peoples. And I think, um, on behalf of a lot of the medical students and I think a lot of emerging medical learners and perhaps a lot of professionals out there as well, I think there's a lot of interest in, in meaningful interactions and, and tangible steps I think that we can take towards building, I think, meaningful relationships with indigenous peoples and communities, either in the office, as for example, when we see them in the, as a patient or even outside of the office when we're advocating uh, perhaps in solidarity with um, these communities. So perhaps uh, I know that there was briefly discussed throughout this event, but perhaps maybe we can each go and talk about like a tangible, actionable that we can all take either in the office or outside to work in more harmony and solidarity with indigenous peoples. That would be amazing. Going to direct uh, one of us, Owen. We can we can start with Dr. John O'Connor. Sorry, sorry, I was just responding to one of the questions. Can you could you repeat that again, Owen? Sorry. sorry. No, apologies, Dr. O'Connor. I was just asking if you had any tangible tips for healthcare providers or or anyone in general for either working with Indigenous peoples in the office 
or outside of the office to engage in advocacy work like you have done yourself? Um, well, I mean, the way it, it landed in my lap, um, you know, I couldn't have planned it better. Um, I would just say uh, being, being open, respectful, honest, and showing, showing that you're, you're acknowledging uh, the situation, the plight um, that the Indigenous populations have found themselves in, have been put in um, by the structure of society. Um, and, you know, just at every opportunity, um, getting involved, mucking in, uh, be, become known as a, uh, a supporter, as one of them, you know, and, and they, you know, like express a unity with them, you know, and, and it starts from there, uh, you know, when, when I started going to the uh, Indigenous communities outside of Port Mac, um, I was vetted and I didn't realize it. I had no idea what I was getting into. And looking back on it, um, it was a very correct way uh, for them to um, address me and, and to get to know me. So oh, being open, being honest, accountable, um, and just being there, keep, you know, showing, showing real interest. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. And I think I'm gonna actually, uh, to actually address one of the questions in the Q&A box. And I, I'm gonna direct this to Anjali, an excellent question that was raised by audience member Mary and Per. Uh, wondering if someone, for example, could speak about responding to the capacity challenges among Indigenous communities. And this um, audience member very astutely recognized that there are so many demands that are being placed on Indigenous peoples right now, given that they're facing so many injustices and environmental concerns. So is there anything that, uh, that can be done in order to improve capacity, given that they're addressing so many like conflicting and simultaneous issues? Um, Anjali, I guess you can start us off. Sure, um, I can start this off and I'd be really interested in hearing the take of the other panelists as well. Um, I actually think in a way for me, this is also the response to your previous question about meaningful engagement, which is to, um, to keep your eyes open and look for where the asks are. And also note that the thing that may be needed may be money. And there was a real, um, I think there was a real desire among the people I was researching with to have the kind of relationship that Dr. O'Connor was just describing, which is like a very close relationship and, you know, developed over time and, um, and like really becoming a part of a community. And I think that is, you know, is possible certainly. And, and especially if you're geographically close, right? <laughs> I think those who were in Toronto um, you know, had different things to say about how to become, uh, how to be good at solidarity than the, the folks I talked with who were in Vancouver, for example, who felt like they were, um, it was a lot easier to feel really connected to a nation because of the geographic proximity. So, um, so one of the examples that someone who actually was really close with a lot of with one nation in particular said was like, look, the people who, uh, he was actually a settler working for one of the First Nations at the time. And he said, hey, like the, my favorite form of solidarity is when a bunch of environmental activists who have the same goals as us organize a local campaign, um, a local fundraiser in their own community, raise a bunch of money and send it over. <laughs> and it was something that I think and that was happening, and I pointed to one of the posters, but I think it was something that doesn't necessarily give folks like the kind of feelings they want <laughs> about doing solidarity, where they feel like, oh, I'm close and I'm, I'm now a, kind of a special part of this. Um, and I, you know, I think one of, one of the things coming out of my dissertation was like, gosh, this is one of the most useful things you can do. You can have a speaker, you can like do some education and raise some money and it, has a really tangible impact. So in terms of something that's accessible for lots of people to do, I would suggest that as, um, as one way to respond to capacity challenges, which often at the end of, of the day are financial. Um, and then be, I'd be curious in, um, for, to hear the other panelists as well. I'll just chime in here briefly. Uh, I've I live in a small community there was a big project about 10 years ago to stop 
Walmart building on the Delta of the Salmon River, right next to an Indian, um, what is still called in BC, uh, an Indian reserve, which uh, just a residual language. And um, at some point it came down to a court case and 10 local citizens each put up $5,000 to pay the $50,000 uh, to pay for the for the first part of the court case, and that was what was needed. That was that was our contribution. It wasn't we we didn't we didn't take on the task. The lawyers working with the in, uh, indigenous community they took on the task. We just said we'll we'll help out that way because we could, and um, that was very much appreciated. Just now, just like you said, I'm sure. I think also uh, my history or my career in mining is is where most of the success, most successful projects on traditional territories are where you're working in partnership with the indigenous groups. Um, and instead of saying, okay, we'll we'll give you this and we're gonna be on your land, it's about them revenue sharing and government to government and getting them to a place where, you know, you're using um, using their haul trucks and you're, you know, saying, okay, okay, when we start producing or you're going to be able to provide this, get this amount of money. So then you can build the ice rink and then just building that depth. Whereas historically, I think it was like here, we're coming to do this and we leave, but it's building that longer term capacity within the groups. So I know um, with the oil and gas, when I was working with the Kirschbaums, uh, much all of our my documentation and letters and correspondence with crew and the Oil and Gas Commission, I, I tried to get in touch. I was uh, corresponding with Moberly First Nation, and the girl couldn't didn't get back to me for seven seven months because she's so bogged down with letters and proposals, and it's it's just heartbreaking because I think that that uh, development in the piece would be something they would really want to stand against, but they just don't have the time. There's only so many people. Would you like to comment, Dr. O'Connor? I mean, my, my own situation, um, again, I, I think of my involvement I, I would be a resource. I, I would, if it's if it's a, a fundraising campaign or just being a pylon, being being a a, a um, an, an usher, uh, you know, whatever um, you can be, whatever you wanted to be, whatever you needed to be, um, I think is is. Um, sort of a basic approach and but it's also a, a very um broad um uh, indication of um involvement or support with without reserve without any, without any conditions you know thank you for that and that was such a great point absolutely that uh, i think it's important to to acknowledge that uh asking ourselves and asking also the, the communities how they can best be helped, I think is a great place to start. And certainly financial support as what Angeli mentioned is so vital because that can allow them to kind of have more capacity and infrastructure for change. There's another excellent question that was raised by uh, Dr. Barzilay in the chat. And um, he has a, basically says that uh, Cape's goal is, that, uh, is to eventually reach a moratorium of any future fracking practices in the northern uh, east of BC, which is a, a great goal. And I guess the question is directed mostly to Karen, but if any other panelists wants to jump in, that's great. What percentage of the population uh, in that area of northeast BC do you think would be in agreement with this goal based on your experiences working with these communities? Um, Probably what percentage, it's a hard one. Um, I think probably 20%. Uh, unfortunately, the way that the regulations are, are set up is that the oil and gas companies pay people to use their property as well, because you can have your surface, you can own the surface, but actually the oil and gas companies own the subsurface rights. So farmers and ranchers, a lot of them, a lot of families get divided because some are 
for oil and gas and some are not. However, I think as time goes on, more and more people would be happy to support or would be in support of a moratorium on fracking because it's the kind of thing you, you know, you saw it sign a small agreement and then it grows and it grows and it grows and every single person I've talked to wishes they could take it back and give back the money. So. Great, thank you so much for your insight, Karen. There's another really excellent question on the chat uh, by Andrea Hall. And this question is mostly directed towards uh, Dr. Halperty, but of course, any other panelists who uh, wants to chime in, feel free. And the question is, are you aware of any examples where settlers have helped, you know, to try to quote unquote air quotes, help to challenge and change the systems that perpetuate environmental racism? And um, how, for example, that might have done an in unintentional effect of actually perpetuating environmental racism as opposed to helping environmental justice. Because you outline those kind of settler tendencies to maybe act out of certain beliefs that are not necessarily in line or in solidarity with indigenous communities. So if you have any kind of unintentional consequences of settler involvement, Dr. Halperty, that'd be great if you can chime in. Sure. Let me just <laughs> think for a moment of what to pull from. I think um, one of the, the pieces that came out of my research that both wasn't my intention coming in and wasn't um, what I didn't, I didn't speak about today were settler activists doing things that they felt turned out to be mistakes or, or in some way went awry and then getting called out about it and then the sort of um, the kind of shunning and distancing and isolation that can happen within the settler environmental movement as people are trying to kind of position themselves as the, the good allies. And, um, and I think there's, there's a lot to say about that. And I uh, wanna think about what's useful. And I think, I don't know if this exactly speaks to the question, but it was almost in times of attempts to, to change the system and to like be better on an individual level that the systems that were creating that individualism were perpetuated. So it was a sort of um, like, you know, I as an environmental activist want to do better. So if, you know, my, someone who I've worked with is getting called out on the internet, you know, I don't want to be that closely associated with them because they're in a bunch of trouble right now in this community. And I actually think that um, that resulted in an, an inability to learn and to learn as a movement to start being able to break the systems in a big way. So there was this like micro sense of, of systems failing to of a really like individualistic culture, um, really pointing to individuals and saying, you're doing this wrong and, um, and a lack of a kind of understanding of the systems that the environmentalists themselves were working in and it like making it really hard to break out of the kinds of patterns that, um, that were causing the mistakes in the first place. And sometimes it would, you know, it would be something like at a conference just to give an example, you know, there'd be an organizing of a conference and yes, someone, a, a local elder would be invited to give a land acknowledgement, but then the, there wouldn't be any more indigenous speakers or something like that. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, at this point, just a few years ago, just shouldn't be happening anymore, um, but was still happening because we, like environmentalism couldn't kind of break out of the, the patterns of like who should be the speaker and who is who should be at the front of the room um, and who the authority is in those contexts. Um, I, I mean, the times where I saw things going well were times, and I mentioned this really briefly, but it was when, you know, for and I, um, some people are anonymous, but not everyone in the dissertation. So many of you might know Tika Newton. She works for the Climate Action Network. I interviewed her. She's not anonymous. And she has a really close relationship with Eagle Lake First Nation. Um, I interviewed a few folks there as well. And they actually reached out to her as a policy expert to say, uh, you know, it seems like you're working on the same thing that we're working on. And she 
you know, would go back and forth and they'd, um, folks, Jordan, Jordan Gardner and his father, who was the chief, and it continues to be the chief, Arnold Gardner would go back and forth to Kenora and, um, and share knowledge and share information. And, you know, that ended up being a really good, not very complicated relationship of like real mutual support and, and even friendship and also like really all pulling in the same direction without getting so um, embedded in the like, oh, I'm a settler activist and what am I gonna do and how am I gonna do better? And this kind of like spinning that, that people would do. Um, so I don't, I don't know, you can let me know Owen if I got to the answer there. <laughs> or not, or uh, if there's a no, Dr. I think that was an excellent response. And I think you really outlined for everyone, like kind of the pitfalls and the potential dangers of performative allyship. And I think we tend to, you know, feel comforted by doing it, but the comfort is only within our own, it doesn't really project to any kind of meaningful impact sometimes. Or we don't reach, as you mentioned, that maximal impact that we could do in solidarity. So thank you for that. There was an excellent question also, uh, by uh, Andrea Hall as well for Dr. O'Connor, kind of recognizing that, uh, of course, we talked about your story and Fort Chip and the various different uh, evidence-based gatherings that are maybe being done or planned in the future by Health Canada and various other like Alberta Cancer Society and stuff like that. Are you still witnessing and recording increased numbers of cancers in your practice? Is there a hope for the community for next steps in terms of these potential evidence gathering and how can we, for example, as a medical community and beyond in Alberta, keep up pressure and redirect pressure to support uh, these communities in Fort Chip? Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of uh, the issues that continue to plague the community of Fort Chip. Um, one of my colleagues, um, a senior physician um, who travels to Fort Chip on a regular basis, um, we had a, a discussion recently uh, about this issue and um, uh, the the shock that was expressed uh, by what's happening in the community was um, was quite uh, tangible. Uh, um, the community itself continues to self-monitor, um, which is unfortunately what it's been left to do. Uh, at one point seven years ago, uh, the community uh, in a, an act of unity um, had a University of Manitoba um, a prof come in to do a, a study of of the um, the issues, and it wasn't an in, in depth study, um, but it, it again highlighted uh, the issues that that are um, a, a chronic problem in the community that they held, and not just cancer but autoimmune diseases. Um, unfortunately, other than that, uh, the powers that be, uh, both the provincial Alberta government and the federal government in in the person of Health Canada. Have done nothing, and there's nothing planned, no no comprehensive, independent look at the community as, as had been promised years ago. It is very frustrating. Um, however, uh, hope springs eternal, uh, and we are definitely um, uh, determined that uh, the the community will self drive a um, a, a definitive. Uh, study uh, and uh, shed a, a strong spotlight on what's going on. You know, it 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 it's been it's in a bit of a a, a bind. For Chip is dependent on like you know a lot of other parts of the province dependent on uh, oil and gas and industry for employment. So it's it's had to sort of uh, um, reconcile the issues in the community, and the environmental changes, the health issues. Um, what's been documented, um, with on the other hand the possibility that um, it could have financial con consequences. Um, nevertheless, it plows ahead. Thank you. I'll, I'll just mention we're going to go over uh, five minutes more uh, beyond our time, just because a bunch of questions still waiting, and, and Owen's doing a great job of shepherding them through. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. All right. And thank you once again, Dr. O'Connor, for that response and for your update on what's going on with Fort Ship. We're all very interested and we all wish the best for the community and for the continued development of evidence and advocacy to support their health. There's an excellent question also on the chat uh, by uh, Dr. Melissa Lem. 
And her question is posited towards all panelists, and I think it's an excellent one. In what you have witnessed, and in the literature, perhaps if you have read it or had engaged with it in the past, how do governments and legal systems treat settler versus indigenous peoples differently when they engage in advocacy work? Are there ways, for example, that we can use this knowledge, either experiential or from the literature, to be more effective advocates and allies? So I, I can jump in just on the anti-pipeline piece specifically, which was the general take of the activists I spoke to was that the power to stop the pipelines largely lay with indigenous legal rights. Um, land defense and legal rights. People said this to me over and over again. Um, it, it complicated the settler relationship to the campaign because it then means that, you know, you settler organization with your right board are mapping out your theory of change and identifying indigenous legal rights as the way that you're gonna stop the campaign. And obviously there's problems with the sort of co-opting there. But that was, you know, I think we can look at the different campaign fights and aside from, um, you know, some, you know, you could argue largely being stopped because the price of oil fell, um, which for sure has an impact that the, certainly the stalling of pipelines happened as a result of land defense and legal rights. And I suspect that's true. I'm just looking at what the, the question was uh, specifically, because I've, I've now lost it, but um, was there, you know, that there's there's a, really a lot of power there. Um, and it's where I then turn to like, okay, let's get those campaigns fully funded. Let's like make sure that they're as powerful as possible in a way that I, as a seller can do. And, uh, and like donating to Raven, like was mentioned in the chat is a great way to do that. So um, that, that is my two cents from the anti-pipeline side of things. It's worth mentioning that uh, for the Site C uh, court case to come up uh, probably next year sometime, something like $180,000 has been raised through Raven. Raven is a very important, helpful organization, settler and indigenous. And that's a lot of money. And that's the kind of money you need to deal with lawyers who work for large corporations, who work for governments. Um, they, they need to be opposed, as it were, by people with real expertise, and that isn't inexpensive. So that kind of thing can be very powerful too. Karen, do you have anything you want to add to the, the answers that were uh, offered for this question? Sorry, can you ask the question again? Sorry, I just kind of got lost in Angelie's uh, answer there. I was really yeah, I was, reflecting on that one. <laughs> so, I got lost in it too, it was so excellent. Um, uh, yeah, it was so good. I was like, oh, I don't know. The question is basically based on like um, what you've witnessed either ex anecdotally or through the literature, like how do governments and legal systems treat settler versus indigenous peoples differently when they engage in advocacy work and how can we use that to leverage ourselves as more effective advocates and allies well i think i what i saw in the piece like with peace environment society was um really uh largely in a lot of the advocacy work was the lack of indigenous participation and and i think it's because of the treaty eight up there is it, it's very kind of segregated it's not really in solidarity necessarily throughout um, the treaty eight area um, however i think that with the advocacy work the government um, really didn't work to provide us with much assistance <laughs> i don't know if i'm answering the question properly but um the indigenous groups i think they probably felt the same way but i can't speak for them obviously but yeah that's pretty much all i could add to that but yeah it was a little bit different than other places of work like in the arctic uh, um you know with the inuit or 
um, in Northwestern BC where a lot of the indigenous groups and advocacy groups are sort of a little more together. So, yeah. Well said. Thank you for that insight, Karen. And I guess I'll let uh, Dr. John O'Connor give uh, also his comments if he would like. I think in indigenous activism and, and advocacy um, chronically faces an uphill battle uh, when it comes to being taken seriously. Um, unfortunately, it, it's a fact of life that uh, indigenous communities and indigenous peoples in, in this country are treated largely as second class citizens and, and you know, have to struggle uh, to be taken seriously uh, as starkly opposed to uh, settler advocates. Um, you know, and it, it's, I, I think it's, it's systemic. Um, it's a matter of um, connections. It's um, very often financial, um, but, but underlying it, you know, it, it's when you're indigenous in this country and probably, you know, in, in the States and in, in many other parts of the world, certainly in Ireland, but, or, you know, I, I represent my ancestors, represent the indigenous populations. We, we were, we had a, a, a challenge always, um, always the underdogs, you know, and no different here. I think we could probably continue for quite some time, but uh, in the interest of other people having other things to do, I think we should draw this to a close. Um, uh, I want to thank, our guests today, John O'Connor, uh, Karen Hosford, and Anjali Helferty for really laying out a case for action and also guidelines for how to undertake useful action. I want to thank uh, Owen, Lou, for your, your stick handling of the, of the question and answer period. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, there's, a, there's a, a, another person on the line Kevin, I wonder if you could turn off your, your off video so that people can see your face and they can realize that you've been in the background making sure that we did not stray into some technological wasteland, but have managed to wend our way through this process. I also want to thank you, the audience, um, for your attention and interest and the questions you've asked and express the hope that what you've heard tonight can inspire you to action um, in addressing environmental racism, which by the way, in BC, thanks to a report from Mary Ellen uh, uh, LaFont, uh, turns out to be alive and well in the healthcare sector. Um, because I think all of us are part of this process, uh, as a number of our speakers tonight have said, uh, we need to ad address marginalization of any and all persons uh, with legitimate ecological and social justice concerns. So with that, I'd like to thank you all once again and say good night to everyone and thank you and may we meet again someday. Thank you. Thank you very much.